Welcome to the Make It Happen podcast. My name is Melanie Moreno. I am a blogger, a content creator, a health coach, and most importantly, I will be your host. Join me for some fun and inspiring conversations with amazing individuals coming up now. Hello and welcome to the Make It Happen podcast. So many good things are in the air right now and it feels like a fresh wave of opportunity is afoot. Perhaps that's just because fall is here, aka the best time of year in my book. I was actually looking this up online recently as to why fall feels so great. It seems like fall has turned into this big cultural phenomenon, almost overshadowing the jazz and excitement that used to exist only for Christmas. So the article I was reading talked about the rise of pumpkin treats and pumpkin spice lattes and that craze. It also gave nods to the fall aesthetics that Instagrammers sort of take on this time of year. There's even a hashtag that started in August called Christian Girl Autumn. So I'm not trying to turn this into a big trendy piece here, but I think people just like having things to celebrate. And that's not a bad thing. I've always been team fall for as long as I've existed, and it almost started to get to me that my favorite season has become so commercialized. However, I've also come to realize that what other people think or do, or how they choose to enjoy something, does not take away from me in any way, nor does it take away from my enjoyment of fall. So today on the show, we've got someone who shares a similar mindset Arturo Velarde is a musician who I connected with through my best friend, Israel. You can hear a cool conversation on discovering art, creativity, and self-confidence with Israel back on episode six. Anyway, I started listening to Arturo's music because Israel had helped record some of his Mona Clay music, which is one of his projects. So there's the song called Green Catacombs and the potential that they come with. And after hearing that song, I just want to chat with Arturo and get to know him a bit more. So in today's episode, I ask Arturo all about how he got started with music, his many, and I mean many, bands over the years, and what he's learned through the process of making music, writing, recording, playing, all that good stuff. I think this was the first time anyone's asked him these questions, so it feels cool to hear him catalog the experience because he is so passionate about music. I know he's headed somewhere with what he's doing. I think this episode highlights dedication and passion in a different way than other episodes with guests have. I like to showcase different perspectives here on the Make It Happen podcast, and Arturo has the most relaxed approach to life. He talks about how he views challenges, the way his friendships inspire him, and why he doesn't like routines. But I was able to uncover one routine that he has, which is pretty cool. You have to listen all the way through to the end to figure out that. So two things really quick before we get started. I record this episode on the same hot and hellish summer day that I recorded Israel's podcast. If you heard that episode, you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I actually got some help fixing up the audio, so today's is still a bit rough, but it's easier on the ears. Thing number two is that Arturo has given me a reason to use my first explicit marker on an episode, so that's fun. The content isn't sensitive, there's just some language, and I just wanted to make sure that I put the explicit label in case anyone listens with their kids or something, so that's the disclaimer. Today's episode is different. It's fun, and I hope you enjoy it. Let's dive into this conversation with Arturo Velarde. If you guys know me, you know that I'm a little bit of a supplement junkie. I like trying out new supplements to meet the changing needs of my body, and that varies from month to month. I look at supplements as a tool to give me a boost in certain areas I need a little bit of help, and sometimes I don't stick with them. So if you look in my supplement cabinet, I have bottles of halfway used vitamins and powders. It's ridiculous. So I have the solution, Care Of. Care Of is a company that makes taking supplements fun and easy. First, what you do is take a quiz on their website to see what your personalized needs are, 
Care of makes a month's supply of your custom-made vitamin pack and then mails them out to you. They also have everything from vitamins and minerals to medicinal herbs to protein powders. The packs not only keep all of your vitamins in one convenient place, but they are made from biodegradable materials and are printed with cute messages. Sometimes there's a little motivational quote or a thought-provoking question on the front. It makes me look forward to taking my daily vitamins. Plus, there's no waste, so you don't get stuck with bottles of supplements that you're not going to want in a month or two. And you have the freedom to change up your monthly order anytime you want. So if you'd like to add some fun and convenience to taking your vitamins, then be sure to check out Care Of. You can go to TakeCareOf.com or follow the link in the show notes of this episode to score $40 off of your first Care Of delivery. If you give Care Of a try, definitely send me a picture and let me know what you think. Talking? So, are you like recording everything? Yeah, I have it going now. That's because, it. Okay. <laughs> well, it's okay because yeah, it's sometimes right. the conversation eases in. I also, I also like starting to record a little early in case someone says something really juicy. Okay. But I'm just gonna like get really comfortable. Yeah, get really. Comfortable. Is this okay? <laughs> I mean, that's okay. I'm very just, comfortable. Like, like don't this. swing it around. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Go okay. <laughs> So, hi Arturo. Thank hi. you so much for coming on the Make It Happen podcast. My pleasure. So, can I just have you start by introducing yourself to listeners? Yeah. My name is Arturo Velarde, and I am a musician. I've been playing music for about 10 years, and that's what I do. That's it. That's, that's literally it. I cook food, I was cook for a while, and uh, yeah, I'm recording an album right now, I'm trying to focus all my time on that now, so yeah, I just got some music in the works, I'm trying to just focus on that, that's, that's it for me. I definitely want to ask you more about your music, but let me first have you talk about, I always like asking what people's upbringing was like. Okay. So, can you talk about that? Where'd you grow up? What was that like? Yeah. I grew up in El Centro. I was born there. I was born in Brawley. I was raised in El Centro. Uh, I had four other siblings. There's four of us. Two sisters, two brothers. Um, I had my mom and my grandma as my parents. They were really awesome. And then, yeah, it was just us six. And then I had two dogs growing up. I had like four dogs. We raised, we like to raise pit bulls, and they're pretty awesome. I have, I have one right now, and his name is Vitalius, and he's a little family dog, and he's great. We call him, I don't know why that's his name, my brother was an idiot, he named him, but that's a cool name for a dog. Brutalius, it's like, what's, well, Brutalius, get over here. <laughs> it's just weird. We call him Bruno. Yeah, I moved out to San Diego about five years to just start making money because there's no money in El Centro. So, well not for me, I didn't know what to do. So I moved here and then uh, I started working as a cook. I've been a cook for the past four years and three years. And um, yeah, that's my upbringing. It's as far back as I can go. When did you start playing music? You mentioned that um, that's, well, that's what you're working on now, and I know it's been something, you had a band previously, yeah. also, right? Yeah, I had you, a few. You've had a few. Can you talk about that, what your musical journey has been like? Yeah, um, I started playing music when I was about, I was introduced to music when I was about 10 or 11. Um, I was at a church, I would go with my grandma, and I would, I would always, like, jam, not always, but the first time I did, I would start to do that. But it started, uh, I started playing drums after service. And um, a couple of days into that, or a couple of Sundays into that, um, this guy would start jamming with me. It was really cool. And that was like my introduction to music. I was about 11 years old, 10 years old. So uh, I bought 
or I got a like hundred dollar classical guitar. And I just try to learn a bunch of songs, and there's like three songs that I try to learn. It was uh, do you like Apitakuba? I don't know Spanish actually. Me neither. They're oh. still a good band. Okay. <laughs> well, there's there um there's a song called Maria that I had to learn. I just oh, I love it. that song. And um, the Legend of Zelda, the Gerudo Valley episode, the Gerudo Valley level, where you're in the rocks. There's this Mexican like esque song, and I had to learn that one. And this classical song, and I learned those three songs, and I stopped playing guitar for like three years, for, like two or three years. And then I just started skating. And then when I was about, I was about thirteen. 13 going on 14, and um, I was riding my board home, and my one good friend of mine was, was playing drums in his garage, and um, I didn't know he played drums, so I knocked on the door, and I'm like, you know, what are you doing? And him and uh, this guy named Javier, they're just like, they're just jamming, they weren't even playing songs, they are just playing punk, loud punk music, and um, I just wanted to do it too, because, you know, it's like, and then Caesar Martinez, which was playing drums. So, yeah, I borrowed his dad's guitar that day, and we just just started making music. And like literally from that day forward, this is when I truly loved. Him. Me and him started a band. We started Vacation on Mars. We were about 13, 14 years old when we started doing that, and that carried on for about a year and a half, maybe two years. So it was a ska band. We ended up getting like nine people at one time. I think there was like eight people on the demo we recorded in total. Yeah, we would just play shows, and then uh, it was through that that I liked music. And then uh, after we stopped playing, I joined a uh, jazz band in high school. And that's when I really started thinking about music musically, not just like with my friends and, you know, like making noise and like, trying to copy songs or something. It was more like I was starting to write with jazz music, it was great. So I started a band called Great Days with uh, some members of it. So Abraham and Caesar. And, uh, we were just best friends. A lot of my music was definitely inspired by the people around me. So like, Caesar and Abraham were my inspiration to make music. And like, we just kept each other going for like, a good while. And we played some shows, and it was great. And then once we all started turning like, 18, I'm gonna start moving out, doing their own thing. So Abe was the first one, a little older than us. He moved out over here. Then I started a band called Fences Thieves, and that was a great band. It was very energetic. There was five of us, and um, all of this music was just centered around punk rock, and like, just in all three bands, you know, it was all just punk rock vibe, you know, very like energy forward and like, yeah that was my last band in in uh in El Centro before I moved out and then, yeah once I moved up here I was doing solo music under the name Mona Clay which uh I do plan on releasing music under still mu releasing music with the name but uh not anytime soon that's a side solo project of mine you know, Mona Clay. It's a cool little thing. Up to current day, I am working on an album with the band that has no name yet. And we don't have any names for our songs. <laughs> but we're in four piece and we're making something. You can believe that. We don't have a name yet. But it's, it's great. It's going to be great. Expect that, like, maybe this year. You know, it's going to be good stuff. Oh, and Pug Spit. But we don't talk about that. But yeah, so a handful of bands. There's a handful of bands I was a part of, and I've written for, and uh, I loved all of them. They're great. What would you say? How would you describe each of those projects and how they resonated with you at that point in your life? Like, I think, okay. I think when you create music, it also correlates with who you are as a person, and that transitions oh, yeah. over time. Okay. Yeah. That's. So starting from the beginning, you know, Vacation on Mars. Like I said, that was, um, I didn't know what I was doing. And um, the thing about that band was that there was 
none of us knew what we were doing. So we um, we were just trying to make songs, and then um, we ended up getting Abraham playing bass, and uh, it got to the point where someone had to start writing songs. So I did it, and uh, I've never done that before. You know, I would the most I did to that was like make my own lyrics like a Linkin Park song you know, and sing that over or something. But um, the vacation it pushed me to write songs which like pretty much molded into like who I am today. Cause, like I love writing songs now. And like if it wasn't for that band I would have never written. And like I'm so happy. Like I'm not extremely satisfied with what we wrote because we're, you know, kids and making, you know, shit shit sounds, but it was great. But um one thing I got from that was songwriting. It made me write and, and it made me express better. And um, that was great. And then it got into Great Days. Once we started playing with the band Great Days, um, it was very expressional. Like, it was very um, expressive. It was, I don't know, I wasn't used to that really, you know? Although I always tended to myself. So. We started playing shows with Great Days, like... What do you mean by expressive? Um, like, the lyrics were very emotional, very straightforward, very personal, like... But, like, I didn't mind it, because I felt like I was doing it in a way where, like... Like, I had to make sure that if I was going to be that expressive about myself and my personal things, like, I wanted to make sure it was good. Yeah, working with those guys, it was... It was fun, you know, we made songs to the point where, like, I could write stuff like that and make it sound in a way where, like, yeah, like, it was always a deal with me, like, I didn't know how to do that, you know, like, the, the ska band before, it was, like, so simple and so easy, so this band was, you know, it was three of us, you know, I didn't have a trombone player covering up my shit singing, and, you know, I didn't have a, a saxophone player to cover the, the whatever, you know, it was just a guitar, bass, and then my vocals so you know we had to really make sure it was good and um playing live was really fun it was always uh the two guys they just they're they're so in it they're so into it and like that just made me so into it too so it was very uh i was very happy every time we played and like it was really nice it was, it was truly grateful like to be there with them it was good Great Days gave me that. They made me appreciate people around. It was so... My friends were such a big part of it. Like, playing and writing those songs and like, setting up shows. Like, we practiced in my friend's back house all the time. Or, like, my buddy recorded us. Like, like our friends supported us so much to where, like, we had a community together because of our music. And, like, Great Days gave me that. So, you know... Vacation gave me the ability to write songs, and then Grey Days gave me the ability to use these songs to make connections with people in a way that, like, I, I don't even know how other people do it. I don't know, like, all my great friends are through music, and, like, that's just, like, what I, I don't know, I think about, like, other people and their great friends, I'm like, I wonder how they met, you know, I wonder how they're, I wonder what they did together when they were growing up, like, me and my buddies, like, we just played music all day, you know, all the time, and that's how my connections are made. So that definitely, like, differentiates, you know. And not me from other people so much, but just, like, like the friendships I have. It, it makes me wonder, but I definitely love Great Days for that. And, um, uh, Benson Steve's the next project was... That was so, um, out of my element. Because, like how I was telling you, um, the music I wrote was very expressive, and very personal, and very emotional. Like, I read about heartbreak, and, or, or like some some things serious. Well, with Fences Thieves, it was extremely different. It was all energy, all fun, all moving, all just sporadic, and like our lyrics. Like we wrote songs. One time, I took acid with a buddy of mine, and we were in the middle of a field, and we came across this like emaciated horse and it was so sad and I was some I was tripping and like I just looked at this thing and I was like petting it and I was like I was so I, I called the animal people after that after I came down and everything I'll, whatever but 
I love, like, I was tripping and I just, we thought this horse was so great, so we wrote a song about it, and it was called Acid Horse, and, like, that's what our lyrics were about, like, a drug trip loving a horse, or, like, my buddy wrote a song about, like, this guy beating his girlfriend or something, like, and, like, in a comical way, which is not funny, not funny whatsoever, I'm not saying that, but, like, he would write about that, or we'd write about, like, I don't remember what our songs were about, um, long story short, you know, it's, like, the songs were wacky, and, like, they were, like, it was more about, like, being, like, a party band, and, like, playing, and making people move or something, or even making them feel a little uncomfortable to an extent, you know? A front man would just do weird shit. He was a, <laughs> was a store, a store Marchesini. He's a weird, weird fellow. But, um, definitely a great front man. So with that music, it made me jump out of my element, you know? It helped me um, just do things I wasn't used to and play guitar riffs that weren't like, you know, an emo riff. It was the more, you know, it really brought out the punk energy that I started playing with. But in a way, we're like, it was more like like put together and more like we knew what we were doing with it. It was like energy that was like harnessed and then we were manipulating it to an extent, you know? That's just things was great for that. Yeah, now I I have I play guitar um, still to this day and um all those bands I feel like I don't really when it comes to music, like I just I'll play whatever I want. I think I can truly say that. Like one day I'll be playing like a metal riff and I can make it go into a jazz like two by one lick or something like those bands gave me all of that and it's great. So yeah, to answer your question, that's how each of those bands have was already said resonated with me. How would you describe I'm I'm actually I'm gonna be honest, I'm not too too familiar with those previous bands. I remember going to shows sometimes and like cool. catching you. Um I have heard all of your Lola Clay stuff, though. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I think because Israel had produced some of it. Yeah. He's like, oh, listen, this. I I love all of your Lola Clay stuff. Thank the, you. I can't remember it, but Green Catacombs? Stuff? Yeah, That's Green one of my Cat favorites. <laughs> really? Yeah, That's I love awesome. it. That's awesome. That's Yeah, Scooter produced that, too. Um, yeah, the Mona Clay songs, that... Those are songs that I did the first album... Heretic was just like in my room. Like I have pictures of my room that basically looked like this, but like the keyboards were there. And it was amps and a desk, and I think my coffee machine was in there at one point. I would make coffee in my room, and um, <laughs> I was literally always in there. I recorded everything myself, and um, I didn't know what I was. I had a a sixteen track Boss recorder, and like no one even uses those things to record. <laughs> like I just had it. So I used it, I was like, I might as well do something. Like, I, I was in between bands, I was in between great, it was a moment between Great Days and Fences Thieves. I didn't know what to do, so I just, you know, did it myself. That's what Heretic was. It was, it was a transition between those two groups. Yeah, each of those songs, they're kind of like Great Days, you know. We don't have official recorded Great Days songs. We have three, but, like, as for other stuff, so I guess you can't really listen to our stuff and get what I'm saying. A lot of our songs were, the lyrics were similar to how Mona Clay was, um, to an extent. Probably that first song. Yeah, all the songs are a little weird, huh? They're all a little different. Like, you got the screaming one, the Thursday Nights one, that's probably like my favorite song that I ever recorded. Thursday they also night. feel really heartfelt. Like, I feel yeah. a lot of emotion listening to them. Yeah, that was a big thing. I really wanted that. I liked I like to try to evoke that in people. I don't know why, but I do. So I'm glad. What were you writing from, or what do you think about, especially now as a songwriter? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you've had a lot of practice. If you've been writing since age what, thirteen, fourteen? Yeah. So, um, what's your songwriting process like, basically? So I think it's like molded into what it is today. But like when I write a song now. It usually starts with the riff. Uh, I'll make a riff, or I'll make a guitar part, or sometimes I'll even make a melody with the guitar, and then I'll add a lyric. I'll add some kind of lyric to it, and then um, 
I'll have like an idea, a very small one, like I'll have a melody on my guitar and then I'll make a, I'll make it into a vocal melody and then I don't know what I'm singing so like I'll start strumming like you know the chord to that melody and then I'll come up with something and then like as soon as I'm singing something I kind of just let it come out. I, I don't know what I'm saying a lot of the time but when I have a lyric that sounds out to me I'll stop and then um, I'll build on it. I kind of like build a story around the lyric. I'm writing a song right now. Um, the other day, like for example, I was I was high. I was really high in this, in this living room, and um, I was full on tripping. Like I, I, I had a lot of paranoia for some reason, and um, I don't know what it was. You know, I'm usually really good with it, but I was I was tripping, and um, I, I kept thinking like something was falling or something, and then uh, I, I just to calm me down, I started writing a. a to like guitar riff. I started writing about like a ghost in my house and if it were to come get me just to save my girlfriend. And that's what that song's about. And now I'm just rolling with it. Like the idea's there. So like every day like I'll sit down and I'll play it over and I'll write a new lyric and a new lyric and then right now I have about a page of lyrics and now my next step is to go to those lyrics and formulate a coherent story or passage or phrase that's the way I like to write songs not so much chorus no verses it's more of a straight shot of just like I'm telling you words that are like something today that's what it's like a lot like and um, back then too I've never been into repeating lines or like I, I like to just make a catchy or, or make something that captivates your ears and then keep rolling with it keep throwing in a riff or something like Mona Clay I don't think there's one chorus on there. I don't think so. Except the last song, which the title of the song is All I Say. So that's how I like to write songs. I like to really just, I get an idea and then I write a bunch of mumbo and then I go back to it and I'll, I'll make it into something. Like I'll change a word or I'll add some commas or I'll add, you know, a but or a just there or I'll change the word to where like it's a real sentence, you know what I mean? That's how I like to write songs and that's how I still write songs today. It sounds like storytelling. Yeah, definitely like storytelling. Yeah, it's very it's very narrative and very like personal. Like I want it to be like if I'm talking to someone. Like if someone's listening, I want I want them to really feel like I'm trying to explain something to them. Do you feel like it helps you work through things yourself, like your personal experiences or your um, you know, things that you're going through by writing or creating songs? You know, I don't, I thought about that. I don't know. I don't know. Because I've been doing it for so long. I feel good. Maybe it's because of the songwriting. I really couldn't answer that question. I don't know if it helps me if I do it because of that. I don't think I do. Well, I guess you would know if, if some, let's say something hard is happening in your life and you feel like, okay, I just need to break away from this and I'm going to work on a song. Yeah. It, is that your go-to method? If so, then maybe it is helping. Yeah. I mean, I'll be, I'll be steaming potatoes and being like, all right, time to play a song. <laughs> like, so I guess with anything I do, it's more like, I'll literally just stand in front of the stove and like strum in between my stirs. Like, I, I think music is so a part of me now that like I really don't know. Maybe it does though. Maybe it does because I feel great most of the time. So and I'm playing music most of the time. So yeah, I guess we should explore it too. I like that you said you feel great. I don't hear too many people say that. Really? Yeah, that sounds really cool. <laughs> That's good. I wish more people felt that way. They want to feel great. I think, or I don't know. I shouldn't say what people should. I do feel great. I am um, usually pretty happy. You know? Can't complain. Very grateful. I think that has a lot to do with... Well, so now the question I want to ask you is what has been your biggest challenge? But I also am now curious to know what's been your biggest challenge, but also keeping in mind that it sounds like you have a... Like your mindset is around, like you just said, you describe yourself as feeling great. And I think you have a positive mindset, which also might, you know, influence the way challenges appear in your life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, okay, going back to the first question, what's been the biggest challenge you feel you've ever had to face? Working a job is a complete waste of time. 
that is the biggest challenge of my life. If I could not work ever, I would be so happy. But money is very important, and that's another challenge, and a job changes that. So it's those two, money and a job. So if I, you know what I mean? All I want is time to play music. So anything that takes away from that is definitely a challenge to me. I mean, before that, it was, uh, it was uh, working a great guitar or a good amp, you know? Having the expenses to, to, to buy those things, that was a challenge to me as well. It's definitely... Like in terms of making music, are you asking? In terms of anything, like any sort okay. of challenge you've had in your, you know, 20 whatever years, anything. Yeah, whatever stands out to you. Yeah, just money. Do you feel like that is a challenge that affects you right now, or it's a challenge that sort of keeps coming up then? Prevents you, as you said, from working on music. I don't know, because it kind of doesn't. It doesn't prevent you from working on music? It, it, or? I don't know. That's a good question. That's a good question. I never actually thought about that. Yeah, just time and money is the, the only thing that keeps coming up to my mind, is time and money. Those things are so... Um, need those things for so many other things and personally I I would like to use those things for things that I don't need to use them for in like a normal society or a normal way to live. I wish I didn't have to. Like a, like people tell me they they go to Coachella and they drop like how much is Coachella? How much is the ticket to Coachella? $100? Yeah and then they're telling me like yeah then you gotta get drugs and you gotta get the hotel and it's like they end up dropping like over a grand on a weekend. Which is cool if you're into that, but like, if I had a thousand dollars and I had a choice between, you know, taking a bunch of Molly in the desert for a weekend with a bunch of strangers or buying a fucking, you know, US made Telecaster, yeah, I'm definitely gonna get a guitar, you know? But I don't have either of those options, <laughs> so, I don't know, um, I don't really know where I was really going with that. Yeah, Melanie, I don't, I don't really know what my choices are. Maybe I don't have any, maybe I, I'm not thinking of any. Definitely. Or maybe you're not thinking of them as too much of a challenge, like I said. Maybe it's your Yeah, maybe it's my mindset. mindset. I, I like to be challenged. Yeah, I, I do. I really I like being put in a situation that I need to get out of. What's a good challenge or what's the last challenge that you feel and you've been like really tested in? So, as I told you, I've been working as a cook for um, about three, four years and I just recently left my last cooking job. A challenge for me right now is I'm trying to fully put myself into a musical life. So what my idea is is to not go into a kitchen, stop using my time to make food and start working in music. So what I did was started applying at like the house of blues, like stage hand or, or like trying to give guitar lessons or like which you should hit me up if you need guitar lessons. But trying to do that, trying to you know, I'm, I'm in school for music now, and trying to find a job in this field that I have no experience other than my own personal experience is very challenging. But even then, I'm not letting it. I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. Like, it's gonna happen, but it's definitely challenging because I have no formal experience with music. So like, I, you know, I'm just some Joe that's like, yeah, I can do this. And I'm just, no, you can't, because on paper, all I know you do is like, I don't flip burgers make mistakes, you know, like, so it's definitely challenging trying to change my professional life into a musical, musical way, that's, the, that's a big challenge of mine, right now, and it's very challenging, but it's very promising, it's gonna, it'll turn around, it'll, it'll get there, you know, but yeah, Tim, there, there you go, there's your answer. <laughs> I like it, that's actually really cool, I think it's interesting that you said you've been cooking for years, and finally... Like, maybe that's the, I won't say it's easy, but maybe that's the easier thing to resort to since you know you have experience in that and you know you can find jobs that way. Yeah. But you're like, I'm definitely no. comfortable, like, yeah, I'm definitely comfortable with the things I can have the experience, but I don't want to do it. Yeah, it's about recognizing, like, you know, where is it that you want to go? And like you said, you're just kind of trying to surround yourself with all things music and yeah. force yourself into that. You ever, uh, you ever watch Futurama? You remember the first episode when uh, Fry is, he gets to the future and they're like, all right, you gotta find a job. And then he's like, all right, cool. And they, 
they want to put the chip in his hand and that tells him, you know, what he has to be based off, you know, his person. And it's the delivery boy. And he's just stressed the fuck out because a thousand years ago, he was a pizza delivery guy. And now, you know, he's so excited that he's in the thousand years in the future. And they're like, all right, let's choose you a job. And he's like, all right, thousand years in the future. What am I going to do? You know, am I going to chase robots? Am I going to, you know, dissect aliens or something? And then the chip is a delivery boy. And then the whole episode is him just like running away from everyone, trying to tell him like I am not a fucking delivery boy, and like I kind of feel like that guy right now in my life. <laughs> I feel like Fry from from Futurama right now. I am not putting the chip in my hand, you know. Like, I don't want to do that. The shitty part is at the end of the episode, he ends up getting this sick ass job on a spaceship, but he's still just a delivery guy for a delivery <laughs> company. It's just intergalactic. Which is cool. I guess there's always a silver lining there. Right? It's a good episode. It's a good show. I think Futurama is one is one of my favorite shows in the world. You like heartfelt stuff? It's a tearjerker. It'll make you cry. It'll make you laugh. It'll give you all the emotions. It's a good show. So now, what would you say is a big mistake that you have experienced any time in your life in anything that you ever worked on or personally? A mistake that you, I mean. I'm sure all of us have those where it's just like this big, huge thing where we're like, oh my gosh, that giant mistake, but it also ended up becoming something you learned from. When did I make a mistake that I can learn from? Um, if there's a big one that stands out to you. Don't cook bacon with your shirt up. It's going to pop up. Get you on the stomach. You learn from that? No, for real. <laughs> um, Ah, that's another one that I'm not to think of. A mistake of mine? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't like to view things as mistakes. But there are mistakes. Why don't you like to view things as mistakes? It, it's, it was going to happen. And you didn't like it, but like it happened. And like it's just perspective. Man. You said learn from it, though, which is, you know, it is a mistake. I'm not saying that mistakes aren't things that happen, but like... I guess I don't like to think of things like that. If I don't like something that happens, like I kind of just, I try to just change the way I look at it. How do you do that? Like, let's say someone close to you does something or says something to you and it, you know, doesn't feel good. Yeah. Like, do you, are you the kind that just brushes it off or do you sort of internalize it and think it over? How do you process that? Like if someone tells you something they don't like? You know, at this point in my life, uh, I do just brush it off. They're not, like, hurting me, but, you know, maybe they could if they said something really bad. Like, maybe years ago, it would, you know, I probably would have, like, something like that could affect me in a way, but right now, I don't know. Um, I guess it really depends on who they are to me. Like, if Abe told me that I was a scumbag one day, like, I'd probably break my heart, you know, I'd probably hate that, but, you know, some joke said... Yeah, we, I don't know. Is my answer that right? What do you mean? Yeah, I, I guess I just wonder how do things affect you, or if you let things affect you. I feel like they let things everything. definitely affect me. Things definitely affect me. I don't know. Like if, if someone's treating me bad, you know, I kind of just think of it like just don't treat someone like that. You know, yeah. I think to myself like just don't do that. You know, like, I didn't like that, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna. Or uh, sometimes I'm, if someone's being an asshat, you know, I'm just grateful that I'm not them. And it makes me so happy. I'm just grateful that I'm not like that. If someone, like I was having pizza yesterday and some guy is listening to my story walking down the street and he's like yelling at us, like mocking our story and like all this shit. And like me and my boy looked at him and we're just like, okay, go about your life, man. Like, like is he going to do that till he dies? You know, it's so sad. So like. I think about it that way, and then on a personal level, I'm just like, I just thank God I'm not like that. I thank God I cannot be like that. And maybe he can't even help it. Maybe he's just a sour apple. But I just try to be careful that I'm not like the person that's trying to make me feel bad. That's all I need to do for this, I suppose. I like that. That's a good answer. Thanks. Finally, a good answer, huh? <laughs> no, I mean, it's always good answers. Yeah, I'm no, just kidding. I mean, I'm not waiting for any particular answer. No, I know. I just want to hear I'm, I'm totally done with this Josh. Since you view so many things positively, what is something you feel 
has been a big accomplishment in your life? The band I'm playing with right now, uh, I wish we had a name, but we don't. That is the biggest accomplishment. I am extremely happy with how these songs are coming out. I'm extremely happy with the people I'm working with. They are all equally as driven to create something great. And I truly believe that what we're doing right now is going to be great. It's going to be really good because everyone's on it. Ryan's there and Edgar's there and Abe is there. That's the name of the boys in the bed. And they're, they're all in it. Like They're all truly trying to make something good. And I'm not used to that. You know, like I told you, my first band was like nine people. You know how hard it is to get nine people on the same page? <laughs> it's really hard. So so having these guys and working with these guys, and they're all great musicians, man. They're all great. And fucking, I don't even go out a lot of times, you know, if I'm, if I'm not surfing or, you know, or making food or something, I'm playing guitar. If I'm not at work, you know, I'm playing guitar and I'm trying to get better. Because I want to be on those guys' level. I want them... I don't want them to ever have to worry about me. I don't ever want to have to worry about them when it comes to creating. And and I believe that I'm actually in a place where that's happening. And it's actually almost surreal. It's weird. It's it's kind of weird sometimes. The other day I felt like I was in such a haze all day. It was strange. I wasn't sick. I, I wasn't drunk. I wasn't hungover. Nothing. I just I was just looking at my life. And I was just, so fucking weird. You know. I just got done jamming with this like. I'm so happy with how it's coming out, and that is, it's not even finished yet, but, yet, but that is probably my greatest accomplishment right now, is with the songs are going to be, and the, the process of it, the process we're doing right now is an accomplishment to me, just the, just the process itself, so, I'm very happy with that, and all of my, a lot of my energy is going to that right now, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's in the making, it's in the working, but it's definitely, it's definitely something that I'm very proud of right now. I was trying to think what motivates you, but maybe right now you were just saying that looking at them, wanting to be on their level, like, that sounds like it's motivating. Yeah, I, I actually came across that realization the other day, is that, like, people like to ask me, you know, what's your inspiration? What bands inspire you? And, and yeah, I have a list. I have some bands. But what truly inspires me is the people I work with. That's what inspires me. Like, especially Abraham. He inspires me a lot. Now Edgar and, and Ryan, you know, the, the other guys in the band, you know, they, they inspire me. I listen to them play, and it's just like, I, I got to make something for them. I got to do this. But we got to make something together. Like, that's what keeps me playing, you know. Radiohead, too. I like Radiohead a lot. And, and that, you know, I'll listen to that and like, try to make some sounds. I'll listen to Bob Dylan. And, and you know, I, I do have bands that I really like. At the end of the day, it's always the people I work with, and just the, car, the guitar itself. You know, it's 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 so like mysterious. There's so many things you can do on it. Like there's so many sounds you can get, especially the electric guitar. Sometimes I'm not even playing songs. I'm just making noise, and that inspires me because it's like no one else can do that. What's in my head, you know, only me, and that's why I love it because it's it's so original and personal. The fact that I can do that, be like original or, or make sound that that is me, the fact that I can extend myself, that is inspiring to me. And then with a group of people that are all equally doing it, like, you know, it makes me short of breath. It's fucking dope. It's, it's, it's really dope. Definitely inspired. That is my biggest form of motivation, is, is the people I work with. I think the people we're surrounding ourselves with definitely influence us. That's also why sometimes people can feel a little stuck if they maybe have this desire inside of them to do something different. They don't really know what they want to do, but they know they want to do something different, yet no one around them is doing this thing, or no one is trying to, it seems, you know, no one's yeah. trying to move forward. What advice would you give to someone in that sort of situation? Just do it, because you're might as well, like you literally just might as well. As grim as this sounds, you're just gonna die. I always tell myself that. Every time I wanna do something, or like I'm scared to do something, or like I think, fuck, maybe I shouldn't do this, or maybe I should, or I really wanna do that, but if I do, this is gonna happen. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think about that, because at the end of the day, I just, you know, I'll pray, pray to God. 
as for guidance. And then I just think, I'm just going to die. You might as well do, do what you want. You know? You're only here for so long. Like, you might as well just do it. Like, what's, gonna, what's the worst that's going to happen? Just going to die. Who cares? Just do it. Just, just do what you want. Like, it's going to happen, too. It's, it's like, like, just focus your, it's perspective and energy. When you want to do something, those are the two biggest things. It's perspective and energy, I believe. So if I were to give advice to anybody about doing what they want to do, change your perspective and focus on what your energy is. And, and just, just, you know, be fearless. Just do it. Just, you'll be good. You'll be taken care of. You know? Taken care of how? Like, you're going to take care of yourself. You're not going to let yourself fail. You got to change your, your perspective on that. When you're doing something, you can't think like, I might fail or this might not happen. Like, of course it might not happen. But like, you can't, that's just a waste of energy. I'm not saying like, you shouldn't be cautious of your decisions. I'm not saying that. It's like, don't go out and spend like a thousand dollars at the casino hoping you might make a million. You know, like don't do, think about what you're doing, but like, it's just perspective and energy. Like, if you gotta make a process to do it, get down on the process, you know? Get a step-by-step -step thing. Yeah, if you really wanna do something. Like right now, I'm trying to do music, and I'm, not, I'm telling you right now, it's not easy. You gotta schedule, you gotta work on other people's schedule, you gotta practice, you gotta, you gotta invest in gear, you gotta try to find a job that doesn't make you tired so you can have energy to do the music. You know, like this whole process I'm taking on right now, it's, it's really not easy, but like, I know I love to do it, so my perspective and energy towards it are going to be positive. So, saying that, like, make sure what you're doing is what you really, really want to do. Don't waste time. You know, you know like I said earlier, you know, you only have so much. So yeah, if you really feel like, like, like what you're doing is right and what you love, you cannot let fear stand in that way. You got to change your perspective and energy. Change how you see that happening, and then like focus your energy on making it happen. It's a lot easier said than done, but like that's what I think about, and I, I pray a lot. I I'm um, constantly praying to God, and I think that really helps. But that's just my opinion. Did you grow? You said you grew up religious, right? No, I actually did not grow up religious. I I grew up having to go to a church with my grandma. I think like anybody else, like, I think anybody can agree that turns you off to the idea, and it did, and I was, I hated God for so long, I just thought it was so stupid, but I never denounced him, which, which I would always make very clear to people, but I hated him, you know, I hated God, I hated Christianity, I hated everything, and I, I think when I was, like, 14, I don't know, I just started hanging out with some Christian guys, and, uh, my buddy Caesar was, like, going to church and stuff. Yeah, I went with him a couple times, and I met this guy named Kurt, Kurt Reynolds. He's a great fucking guy. The way he explained God to me, it was uh, very different. It turned me back around to, like, you know, Christianity. And then uh, I met my friend named Oscar Flores when I was about 14. And uh, his views on the Christian God, you know, the, the Holy Bible, the God described in the Christian Bible or the Holy Bible, he, uh, he thoroughly studied that book and other religious texts and uh, I hung out with him a lot and uh, he really changed my view. He really opened up how I saw God. How's that? Like, how would you describe your view before and after? When I was Christian as a, as a kid, it was more like I was forced. You had to do this. Like, you couldn't do this. And then like the whole thing about like, you know, homosexuals and like all this and like, I don't know, just sin and like people judging and like, I hated that because I, I always thought like, you know, can't, can't hate anybody, so I hated God. And then uh, the way Oscar explained, it, God is just as ugly as us. We're in his image. And like, the fact that God forgave us, we should forgive others. So I don't know how to go too into that, but forgiveness was something that I didn't understand completely until I talked to Oscar and how he felt about God. Like, you can't hate people for sinning, which is what Christians do. Christians hate when you sin. That's just how it goes. And uh, that's how I thought it went. What changed me was that, like, that's not what a 
Christian that like if a Christian is saying they hate something like I don't know, like gays for example, they're not really Christian, and that changed like just that small example. That kind of idea changed my like that's what I started thinking about like you can recognize sin but you don't have to hate it, and and that's how I thought about it. I mean you should hate sin but you can't hate like a sinner. You can't hate other people. You can't hate people's flaws. That's what I thought Christianity was doing, but it's really not. People just morphed it into that. But what Christianity truly is about is, is forgiveness, you know? It's about love and self-love. And I love those things. I thoroughly love those things. And that's my view on God. And, you know, as I read the Bible, you know? I don't, I'm not going to go to church every Sunday or anything. And, you know, I'm not going to stop drinking. Like, I'm not saying I'm perfect. And I'm, I'm not telling anyone that they should be anything. That's just my personal view on God. I'm not advocating for Christianity in any way whatsoever. It's just what helps me. That's how I view it. Yeah, I just feel like God is just this cosmic love, this cosmic unity amongst all of us. And I love to pray for people. I love to keep them in my mind. And um, I love to pray for myself. You know, I didn't do that all the time. You should pray for yourself, you know? I don't know. That's how I view it now. That's how I view God, and that's how I view my spirituality. It's, it's very personal. It's not, like I said, I'm not advocating for any religion. Like, I really am not. It's just, that's my, that's how I go through things. It helps me, too. It, I, I think it helps anybody. You know, just pray for Pray for the people you like. You know, love. It changes. You know? When you really feel like that for someone, it's like, no one's making you do it. No. I don't know. It helps me though. It definitely gets me through things. I can honestly say. We're soon gonna wrap this up. I'm gonna go into some closing questions with you. So my first one is well, I'm actually curious to hear, do you know what your sun sign is? Yeah, I'm a Scorpio. I know my other ones, too. You do? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's your rising and moon sign? Uh, my sun sign is Scorpio. Um, my moon sign is Sagittarius, and my rising sign is it's Gemini. Yeah, it's Gemini. That's my rising sign. Interesting. Yeah. I love that. Well, what does that mean, though? I don't even know what it means. I just know it. <laughs> well... I mean, you can read on the qualities of each one a little bit more, but... So your sun sign is the sign that that's the most authentic you. The you you live with every day, basically. Or the you that, if someone gets to know you, they're seeing your rising sign, they're seeing your Gemini side. And as they get to know you more, then they see you as being Scorpio more. Oh, okay. And your moon sign is more of the emotional underside. You said it was a... Sagittarius. Sagittarius. So, like, let's say someone, like, if someone wrongs you, or, like, this is how you're going to react, using your moon sign. Mm -hmm. Or, whenever you feel a little emotional, it's going to appear in a very Sagittarius sort of way. So, I actually think it's kind of cool to know those when, if you, if you read horoscopes, or, like, when there's big eclipses happening, you can kind of look at, let's say you're, you feel emotionally drained, these days, you know, and then there's an eclipse happening soon, and you'd want to look at how Sagittarius is affected, and then that kind of, and not that you need to seek guidance in these things, but it might sort of align. I noticed a lot, a lot, uh, when I started looking into astrology, I noticed how things aligned okay. a lot that way. Um, I feel like it's just a tool to help you get to understand yourself better. That's interesting, though. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I was asked that so many times. I just, you know, one day just went on the internet, I was like, what is it? I'm going to it up. Uh, yeah, so now I have the answer to that question. <laughs> so it's funny. I can see the Gemini side also, like, for someone who doesn't know you, it looks like you wear many hats. And many hats? Yeah, like you... I you do have a lot of hats. Like, I got that one. I got this nice one with the... Oh, just what do you mean? Figuratively, not literally. Like, the, have you heard the phrase... Someone wears many hats. No, it's like a oh. jack of all trades or something like that. Or kind of, but not necessarily with the master of none. Just wearing many hats means you are passionate about many things or you're doing a lot. Um, maybe if you are wearing many hats 
as a musician, you're like, well, I don't have someone to produce my music, so I'm doing that. I don't have someone to like record this for me, so I'm doing that. I don't have a basis, so I learn to play myself. Like, you okay. then wear many hats, and that can be applied in a small scale area like that, or just generally. Like, I never heard that. Many hats. I have a lot of hats too. So <laughs> it's cool. If you were stranded on a deserted island, what is one thing you'd want to have with you? A guitar. Yeah, that'd be a guitar. Or food. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> or food. <laughs> am I am I giving food on the island? Like, what's up with this island? <laughs> anyway. You get to create your own island, however you think. Alright. Someone else was like, well, there might be coconut, it could be fat. Yeah, if I can just, like, if the food's already growing there, I'll take a guitar. I don't know. Yeah, let's go with the guitar. Final answer. What are some routines or habits that you have that make you feel like your best self? <laughs> I don't know. Is that a complex question? <laughs> like, what are my habits that make you feel like my best yeah, self? Yeah, like doing something, you know, it, it could be something small or something large, just doing something that, you know, makes you feel connected to yourself, or like starting your day this way, uh, prayer, anything that makes you feel like this habit or this routine that you have makes you feel like you. I don't know. I don't know. I really couldn't answer that one. I try to think of everything I do in the day, but you know what I notice is that I don't have a habit. Of, I kind of just do shit. I won't do things in order. Like. And does that work for you? Could you go, you know, several days without doing certain things and you'd be fine? Or, like, is there one thing that you feel you need to do every day? I mean, other than play guitar, you know? And even then, I don't do it every day. Like, I should, but I would say that, yeah, I, I, I don't know, I have to get back to my normal, I suppose. Yeah, I just don't, I can't think of any habits that I have. I bite my nails sometimes, but I'm really good at it. Right? Look how fucking straight those are. Yeah, they look good. It's all teeth. A little gross, but that's a habit that I've done really down. Pretty proud of that one. Best self, for sure, no, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's all I could think of. I've gotten really good at that. Yeah, that's about it. Maybe it's flexibility. It sounds like you're interested in many things and you're kind of all over the place, but maybe that's what works for you. Yeah, maybe it's what works for me. I'll go with that one too. Some people like routine. A lot of people like to have, whether it's something small, like I said, or a larger routine, but some people don't need routines. Yeah, I actually hate routines. To be honest with you, I, I don't like that. I don't like having to do some, like, I hate scheduling stuff, but it's, uh, I'm always late. I'm always late to things. I don't know, I can't, uh, when it comes to order, like, it's just it's so much sometimes. Yeah, you know what, that, that final answer, you got it, you found it. That's, that's, I don't like it. I don't like making routines, I suppose. I'm not good at it. So I guess I just don't do it. Okay. Okay, so... What's one thing people might not expect that you'd be into? Panic at the Disco. Oh. Guilty Pleasure. I love that band. Really good. I love one album from them. You really can't sweat out. I love that album. You like it too? It's so good, right? It has it all, man. All of the bangers are on that album. Um, you know what? I do have an answer to this. There's definitely some things that I like to do that I love. Yeah, Panic of the Disco is like the best one. I can come <laughs> okay, you can let me know if you think of something else that you really want to include. Like, okay. I'll try to keep it in my head. <laughs> How about the best piece of advice anyone has ever given you? It's a couple. Um, best piece of advice anyone's ever given you. You leave something better than how you found it. That's something that comes up to my head. I like that. I don't always follow that, but I love to give piece of advice. A good piece of way to live your life, you know? Try to leave it better. But even then, that's not really a life piece of advice I'll give you. I don't know. I mean, it, it doesn't need to be the biggest piece that guides everything, but something that just stands out to you. You know what I do? I will read the Proverbs in the Bible. There's 31 of them. Can you read one every day? It's pretty cool. Oh. I do that, you know, in the bathroom or like, you know, if I'm chilling here, like, 
I'll make a point to like open up the proverbs and it's always just, you know, just a way like to do You something. do that every day. I try to. But yeah. It sounds like a routine. Oh, you found it. Yeah. I gotta stop doing it. No, no, no that prepared. sounds really cool. So. But I don't I, even do it every day. But most most days you like to. Yeah. That's definitely. all right. That's definitely. still okay. And it's it's something small and picking it up. It, yeah. So, I'm not familiar with it. Does it just provide a message and it sort of like? Stays yeah. Up? Um. It, it's the proverbs are just like ways to to live your life. They're, they're ways to think about things or they're ways to like treat yourself it's always about like how to be a better you for everyone else too the proverbs are a way to live a healthy like have a healthy like mental outlook on things they're very beautiful i recommend you read them try it okay try it just go on the phone you know what's today today's the 27th yeah just open up your phone you know look up proverbs chapter 27 read it verse 27 or whatever you never know, you know? You might love it, you might not have it useful, and then like a week later you'll be going through something and be like, oh, yeah, that's that verse, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's, it, I love those things. They're, they're very advice. They give advice. Okay. That's what I'm trying to say. My vocabulary is very bad. <laughs> okay, what's a book, a movie, a podcast, or any sort of resource that you would recommend to listeners? Something that's inspired you and you recommend to listeners? Bible. It's a good book. Um, the Phantom Toll Booth is a really good book. Have you ever read it by Norton Juster? I'm not sure. Oh my god, it's such a good book. It's like a, an adventure book. This little kid is like, he just has this mundane life, and then like, he gets home one day after like, he's fucking depressed. This is a little kid, and it's like, god damn, like, this kid is sad. And then he gets into his house, and there's this toll booth in there. And he's like, what the hell is going on? And he answers the toll booth, and he's just in this crazy world, and he meets all these wacko characters, and then one of the characters is uh, Talk, and it's a dog that has a, cl a clock on his chest, and it only ticks. And his brother's name is Talk, and his clock only ticks. And, like, the, he's trying to look for his brother, and, like, they're just going through the world, and then he ends up being so grateful for everything because... Because the people he met and like everything he met in the world was just so beautiful to him. And then he gets out of the, he's trying to get home the whole time. Gets out of the toll booth and then he turns around, the toll booth is gone. He never gets to see any of those people ever again, but he's so happy after that. It's a really weird ending. It's like kind of sad because like, damn, that world, like it wasn't really real. Someone kind of just like, you know, moved him a little toll booth real quick. But the book itself is very beautiful, very like. It goes into like the world of math and the world of English and the world of just everything that seems mundane to you that makes it like, you know, I read that book growing up, I read that book as an adult again, and I just I absolutely love it. But I definitely recommend that as a read to people. Movie? I want to answer all of them now. Oh, okay. A movie that I recommend people watching. I want to say Good Will Hunting. I rewatched it the other day. It wasn't that great. Maybe I shouldn't have rewatched it. I watched it when I was 18, very inspirational. I watched it when I was 24. A little drama, too much drama for me now, but that's a good movie, I would say, like, five years ago. Futurama's a good one. I'm going to emphasize that. You should watch Futurama more. Okay, yeah, that's it. Next question. I don't know. <laughs> I eat music podcast. You know, support Omar. That's a good podcast. It's also local. Jazz 88.3, if you're in San Diego. Constantly playing great jazz music. You know, if you're looking for jazz, it's a good radio station. I like to support them. That's it. Oh, cool. I don't know about that station. 88.3 or jazz88.org. I have a website. Awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay. So, what's next for you? I'm going to record a great album. That's what's next for me. I'm actually recording after this, tracking guitars tonight. And uh, we're starting it. That's what's next for me. We have um, about 45 minutes of music that we intend to play live towards the end of the year. We get together one to two times a week to make that happen. So today we decided to record what we have so far. And yeah, that band. Uh, a band name is next. Yeah, maybe by the time this comes out, you might have a name. Oh, yeah, hopefully we will. Uh, it's just the names that have been proposed. If you have a name, just 
shoot it, but um, the only one we got so far is Macadamia from the drummer. It's so dumb. So if you can beat Macadamia, you know, you can use that. And, like, none of us know what to make. It's, it's nerve-wracking, you know? It's like, what are you going to be named? Like, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so where can people find you? Where can they keep up with you? Social media links, website? Um, my Instagram is xtvm, which is e-x-t-v-u-m-m. Maybe there's a third M. I don't know if there's a third M. So it's xtvm or xtvm. But it's one or the other. That's my Instagram. I'm usually posting snippets of, you know, my guitar and playing updates with the band. No, uh, that's my Instagram and that's about it. That's all I really use. Well the band can't soon really make. But that's it. Your SoundCloud, maybe? No SoundCloud. No SoundCloud. Uh, I have stuff on Bandcamp if you wanna check that out. Uh, greatdays one dot bandcamp dot com, fences dot bandcamp dot com. MonaClay.bandcamp.com. Those are all music that I'm affiliated with. Okay, awesome. Everyone's going to need to check out all of those musical projects that you have and stay tuned for more for good stuff. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was fun. It was a bit different, right? When talking with Arturo, I felt like I was twisting his arm to get an answer sometimes, but there were many good nuggets in there. And I think the coolest things come when you look at the bigger picture. My favorite part of the episode is simply seeing how he embodies that message of trying to leave things better than the way he found them and just live authentically. I think he recognizes that he's at a pivotal point where he can redirect his life to where he wants it to be. And that choice is in his hands right now. I hold the belief that anything can be done if you really want it. You just need to be committed. And that's where things can get dicey because going all in seems so scary and it's risky. He said that he had been working as a cook for several years and he finally left that and doesn't want to keep doing that same thing that he knows how to do. But if he wants music to be the priority, then it's about immersing himself in that field some way, somehow, because that's where he wants to be. And that really resonated with me a lot, just thinking of how you can't keep wishing for something to change while you're still doing what you don't want. I'd really like to hear anything that stood out to you from the episode. Please leave a comment on Facebook or Instagram, share the podcast with a friend, and if you've listened this far, leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would mean so much to me to get your thoughts on what you'd like about the podcast and what you may want to see more of, or hear more of, I should say. We do still have one episode left this season, and I won't say I left the best for last, but I am really excited about next week's guest. Subscribe to the podcast so you'll be the first one to know when the episode is released. Until then, have a great rest of your week. Bye, guys!